Hi there, everybody. Uh, I want to start by thanking all the amazing donors who have supported both Code.org, but especially Infosys for an Infosys Foundation for hosting us here. Uh, this would have been possible without their fantastic support uh, through the years. And anything that uh, you know, everything that they've done, providing quality computer science education in our schools is really thanks so much to these donors. Um, I start almost all of my talks with the story that we just briefly heard about growing up in Iran with my twin brother and learning to code on a Commodore 64 and really becoming a, a second industry poster dream. This is not working at all. Um, but I want to actually say a different story uh, because this is a, you know, that's my usual computer science speech that nobody here needs to hear because it's relatively, it's, you know, talking about the importance of computer science that everybody has heard about. Uh, and when I got invited to give this talk, uh, I was asked to give a different talk to talk about the lessons learned from building code.org uh, and about how we learn to scale and what are the things that are, you know, advice that other people starting their own nonprofits or programs in computer science can learn from us uh, to, to scale similarly. Um, and so I should say this is a talk that I've not given before. As when we were asked to tell our neighbors something that we were hoping to get out of our time at Crossroads. My, what I'm hoping about at this time is not failing <laughs> with this set of slides because I've never presented them before and I don't know how it'll go. Um, but I wanted to start instead of my usual story, uh, a more personal story uh, because this is going to be a slightly more personal presentation. Um, so this is the story of the olive, uh, olive brown immigrant who came to the United States knowing almost nothing about American society. Uh, and I came here in seventh grade uh, started seventh grade wearing a suit and tie because that's how we dressed for school in Iran uh, in uniform. And I desperately wanted to fit in and make friends. Uh, but this was right in the aftermath of the Iran hostage crisis. Uh, so instead I was, I heard locker room chants about bombing Iran uh, and I quickly earned the nickname Jihad because it sounded similar to my name, I guess. Uh, and really I learned from that that there's no faster way to learn about the importance of inclusivity than being the object of discrimination. Uh, lucky for me, I chose to go into the computer science field and the tech industry where the color of my skin, uh, you know, my gender, and even my Middle Eastern background immediately gave me enormous privilege. Uh, and uh, you know, the reason I started Code.org ultimately was because privilege is bullshit. Uh, and because having gone from the bottom to the top so quickly and seeing that difference, uh, it really meant something to me to, to help create equality. Uh, you know, our vision is that every student should have equal opportunity, whether you're an African American or Latina student in urban Chicago, or a white student in hollowed out rural Kentucky, or a Palestinian student in the, in the Golan Heights in a refugee camp, you should start off with as close to a similar footing as possible. We've been blessed to be now at the, to, to have spearheaded and sparked the most bipartisan, fastest growing movement in the history of education. Uh, I show this slide all the time and joke that this is a group of teachers uh, doing the Hour of Code, uh, but it's a rock concert. Um, uh, but what's impressive is there's a thousand teachers in that slide, which means the number of teachers who have embraced computer science in just the last five years is more than a thousand times what you see in that slide, which is unbelievable if you think about the impact. And each of them has reached at least a hundred students in, over the last five years. There's over 100 million students that have been exposed to computer science in the last five years since we started Code.org. And it's just such an incredible thing, thanks to the teachers that have, have basically embraced this new field. Uh, now, speaking of the movement, uh, there's a chart I want to show, which is a chart of monthly active users. Uh, and there's an important thing about this chart, because this isn't the chart of Code.org's monthly active users. Uh, and I, you know, I often talk about how much we've grown our usage, but this is a chart of Scratch monthly active users. And I mention that because the way we can measure the strength of a movement is it's a rising tide that lifts all boats. And you can see the, the sudden moment where that curve started changing, which is roughly when the first hour of code launched. And whether you were working at Scratch, whether you're a Tinker, Code HS, Code Academy, all of these startups collectively saw this incredible rise uh, from this movement of, for computer science. Another awesome chart uh, is this chart, which shows uh, 20x growth. Um, and what is this a chart of? This is the, a chart of congressional mentions of computer science or coding 
in either the House or the Senate, uh, which has grown 20x thanks to the, the work of so many advocates talking about this field from a policy standpoint. And as the pie chart shows, it's been almost 50-50 between the two parties. This is one of the few subjects in, in today's politics that has absolutely no party affiliation and has been completely bipartisan, which is so fortunate for those of us working in it. Uh, so I love how we've built something together that started out with individual teachers, teachers like Juan Lonzano from, from Highline in Seattle, and has grown to a million teachers, each of them bringing on their schools. At this point, almost half the schools in the US teach some form of computer science. To, to then growing from there to district, over 200 districts have, have either embraced computer science deeply in their curriculum or at least pledged to do so. Then to states, as Cameron Wilson said earlier this morning, where 43 states have embraced computer science policy, and all the way to countries where at this point in the last five years, 25 countries have either embraced new policies or funded uh, computer science to the tunes of many hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and not just the entire national policies, there's been presidents and prime ministers like Enda Kenny of Ireland, David Cameron in the UK, Justin Trudeau, uh, the presidents and prime ministers of Armenia, Jamaica, Taiwan, Romania, and of course, President Barack Obama, all having uh, embraced computer science or doing the hour of code or taking some kind of measure to inspire students. Uh, now, one thing I want to say, code.org obviously has played a pretty significant role in, in growing this stuff. Uh, we just recently passed our five-year anniversary, and I put out uh, a blog post, which was inspired, actually, by something Krishna from, from Tinker told me about talking about all talking about basically giving back or talking and thanking all the people who have helped make this movement possible. So whether it's been our donors, the many course providers we've worked with, outreach partners, facilitators, regional partners, many of whom are here today, international partners, infrastructure providers, brands, our advocacy coalition, government advocates, and then many, many individuals who have helped us. This has been just an unbelievable thing. Uh, now, we've celebrated a lot of success. Uh, we've also had a number of mistakes and failures. Uh, and what I was asked was basically to help basically talk through some of the things we've learned, whether through the ups and downs, uh, about how Code.org has worked, uh, and to, to basically, if, there, if I can impart any advice from that. Uh, and really, so much has been given to us by the community, whether it's advice, help, support, confidence, and literally our people, half of the people at Code.org came from the CS community. and so to the extent we can give back in the form of any form of advice uh, and learnings to the community, uh, that's one way we can give back. Uh, now to, to help give lessons about what I've learned from code.org, I want to start by explaining the four parts of what we do, uh, because most people only know one or two parts of what we do. There's enough of what we do that for most people it's a sort of a complicated organization. Um, but the four ways I think of what we do, uh, one part is building and sustaining this global movement, whether that means driving the hour of code, whether that means recruiting presidents and prime ministers or celebrities, breaking stereotypes, etc. Uh, the other piece of what we do is building the code.org curriculum and the code studio learning platform. Uh, and then hand in hand with that is the outreach we do through schools and hosting pro the professional development and professional learning programs that are training 70,000 teachers or almost at 100,000 teachers having gone through our workshops to become computer science teachers. And then the last part is the policy change we do and the government affairs to get states and even the federal government to basically take policies to embrace computer science. I describe these as four pieces of a puzzle uh, because there's a lot of people that wished we did only the left two halves of the puzzle. Uh, and those are the people who basically also do things in the right half. I've often heard from people, why are you guys doing your own curriculum? Why don't you just stick to to building the movement and the policy change. Uh, and the answer I regularly tell them is we couldn't do any one of these pieces without the rest and have the kind of success we've had. The reason we're so successful is because these things fit together so well and they support each other and they basically, each one of them is successful because of the collective strength of the whole. Uh, but that alone isn't the reason why we've been successful. I think one of the most important keys to our success has been the values we've chosen as an organization and the culture of how we work. And these are things that lots of people can learn from. Uh, these are the values we publish on our website, but there's three of these that I think are particularly important to, to talk about. Uh, these three on the left, which I want to talk about individually, 
not just because of code.org, but because these are values that an organization that wants to grow at the sort of pace that we've grown uh, and have the kind of scale we've had an impact can learn from these. Uh, the first is the idea of thinking big but acting small, uh, which is a little bit, uh, I guess, those are two opposites. And the thinking big part is about setting r ridiculously audacious goals. Uh, one thing I've learned from doing code.org is that ridiculously audacious goals are ironically easier. Uh, you know, when Elon Musk talks about getting people onto Mars, everybody wants SpaceX to succeed. And so there's so many people that come out of the woodwork to make it happen and to, to basically support them. For us, similarly, when we launched the first hour of code, uh, we had no business doing that. There was, I think, five of us when the idea first formed. But we said we're going to get 10 million students to code in one week. Uh, and with all the outpouring of support that came behind that idea, we reached 20 million. I think if we had aimed lower, we wouldn't have made nearly as much success. And it's because we set such audacious goals that we've managed to grow so big. Um, but the second thing besides thinking big is to act small. Small startups act immediately. Uh, my favorite example of this is when we decided to launch our K-5 affiliate program. We had been traveling around the country to train individual teachers here and there, and we decided, why don't we get a network of affiliates that can basically do these training, uh, these facilitators that can tra train teachers in their own cities. Uh, and I just met one of the, our facilitators from Maine a few minutes ago. Uh, when we decided to do that, it was literally we had a meeting saying this is a good idea, and by the end of the meeting we said we'll do it, and then one week later we announced the program and we had a thousand people apply, and then we're like, okay, now we need to create a curriculum, <laughs> and we need to create a professional development like agenda, figure out, like we hadn't figured out any of it, we basically had the, we announced the program and had the people on board uh, before we even knew what it was gonna be. And then the other part of acting like a startup is the idea of you can do it yourself. Uh, and I say this for there's so many things that people think, well, I've never done you know, PR before and we need a PR firm to do that or we need to hire somebody who has experience talking to the press or working with contracts or things like that. Uh, and when we started, we did, I personally did almost every one of those things. Uh, in fact, it, it took us years before we got a PR firm. Many of the things that people at code.org do, they've never ever experienced doing it before. Uh, but we don't have this approach of if there's something that needs to be done, let's hire somebody. We, we think if something that needs to be done, we just do it ourselves. Uh, the other critical value to our growth has been this idea of agility and responsiveness to feedback. Um, by far the most important advice I've ever gotten at code.org uh, was, was from somebody who was basically giving us feedback and it was a conversation I'll never forget. I met with, I came to a SIGSI conference uh, and I met with Jane Margolis and this was right after code.org had first launched and it was just one of me at the time. Uh, and I had spent the last two months working out a plan for what code.org would become, and it was the idea that was to build an, a network nationwide of after-school clubs. Uh, and Jane Margolis gave me this look, uh, this pained look that if, if you know her, I'm sure you know the look I'm talking about. I was like, ooh. Uh, and all I could think was like, make that pained look go away. Um, and she said, you know, if you build a network of after-school clubs, you're gonna make the equity problem worse, not better, because the kids who go to after-school clubs are already the lucky kids, and so you're gonna advance the lucky kids even more, and you should try to, to you know, change the entire school system. Uh, and so within one hour of that meeting, I basically was like, I threw away the old plan, and we course corrected, well, we was just me at the time, but uh, you know, that course correction was the first of 14 different course corrections Code.org has had over the last five years. I actually keep a document of these, and there's two or three more that are on the horizon. Uh, now, feedback doesn't always sound kind, but it often comes with the best ideas for improvement for growth. Uh, and as we've grown at code.org, it's really easy once you become successful and grow to think that you should continue doing things the way you do, because we've always done it that way. Uh, but, but one thing about the way we work is we're constantly questioning the status quo uh, and constantly thinking about what, what has changed in our world and how do we act differently. Yeah. The third key value we have is this idea that this, what we're doing is a community effort. And I'm not just talking about thanking the community and recognizing the community, but also about how we approach things. Before we do something, we wonder, is somebody else doing it better than we could? Uh, and sometimes th somebody else is doing it, but we, <laughs> they're not doing it better than we could. So that, you know, that leads to issues. And we also wonder, should we do this alone, or could we go faster or better with partners? And this has been incredibly critical to how we've scaled is by leveraging partnerships to grow. Uh, now to go through the sort of steps of how we've scaled, which is the 
topic that I was asked to speak about. There's many different pieces of advice I would give to a nonprofit or a new organization that's trying to scale, whether in education or in any kind of field similar to ours. Uh, the first and most important piece is, this, is to hire people smarter than oneself. Uh, by far the greatest success of Code.org has been because of the fantastic staff we've hired. You know, when it came to creating curriculum, we hired teachers like Baker Frankie, who's a genius when it comes to curriculum. Or when it came to doing PD, hiring people like Brooke Osborne. Uh, or when it came to doing government affairs, hiring Cameron Wilson, who is by far the best person at what, what he does right now. Uh, so our second learning and piece of advice is that to pick messaging that resonates with consumers. And this is something that education organizations almost always get wrong. Uh, I've gotten so much crap, especially from this community, for picking the name code. Uh, and the reason I picked the name code wasn't because I wanted to build coding into schools. Uh, I have this email message that I uh, dug up that's from uh, six years ago before code.org even existed when I was brainstorming the different names for the organization. Uh, and if I had been an education organization, I might have chosen learncs.org, uh, which was much closer to what I was trying to do. Uh, but the name code.org resonated much more easily. It was more obvious that this was going to be something I was going to spread. Uh, or when we named the Hour of Code, not only the name, but just the, the number where we show the number of students having done the Hour of Code. I know just as well as anybody else that the number of students or the number of times somebody has tried the Hour of Code is probably the most bullshit measure of impact, uh, <laughs> frankly. But, but it inspires people to think, like, oh my god. And like, it, it basically generates excitement in our movement. Uh, and so, and it's something that resonates with consumers. And that's something that the traditional academia and education establishment doesn't naturally get. And it's really important to figure out the balance between having a sort of solid footing in academia and, and education, and yet also having a messaging that resonates with consumers. Uh, speaking of resonating with consumers, recruiting celebrities and brands is something that obviously Code.org has done, but any organization can, especially a nonprofit, can aim to do, and I encourage people to do it. Uh, it is not at all easy. It took uh, about two years or three years to get the President of the United States to engage, and it wasn't, you know, it was a multi, every single month trying some different way to get something to happen. It took years to get Disney to let us use Anna and Elsa from Frozen or the Star Wars characters. And for every celebrity or brand you've seen Code.org engage with, there's at least two or three that, that have not uh, agreed. Uh, there's a list of people that I've been working on for at least four years, <laughs> like Beyonce, Elon Musk, Ronaldo, and even the Pope. Uh, um, <laughs> If you work at Code.org, you actually get almost every few months updates from me of, on the like, long Ahab's quest of trying to get the Pope to do an hour of code, uh, and which is literally something I've been working on for four years. Uh, but I'm saying this because uh, eventually it's going to happen. If you see any one of these people do anything involving computer science education, it's because of just persistence and trying to make it happen. And if any of you want to engage celebrities, you should look at least at your local sports team and try to find one athlete within that sports team that wants to support STEM. I guarantee every one of you uh, has an athlete in your neighborhood that would do that. Uh, and it's just about finding them and approaching them. And you don't need to hire somebody to do that. You could do it yourself. Uh, and that will help inspire students uh, in some way. Um, Another piece that has helped us scale is engineering for scale. And by that, I don't mean just keeping the servers running. Uh, I actually mean engineering for, for growth. Uh, and you know, this thing I showed earlier about the hour of code sort of messaging, by far the most important thing you see in that little hour of code messaging is the button that says start. Uh, that button used to say get started. Uh, and we, ran, we had our engineers do an A-B test to just try different words and language to see which button language is most likely to get clicked. The difference between get started and start made a 20% difference, which if you look at the number right above it means about 100 million times that button got clicked more because of not having the word get in it. Why the word get? I don't know. Uh, but but you know, A-B testing on websites makes a big, big difference in terms of adoption. So tens of millions more students have tried the hour of code uh, because of that button change. Um, another thing in terms of our scale, and this comes back to the culture of acting like a startup and agility, is 
is this idea of ready, shoot, aim, uh, which means basically acting immediately when you, when you have enough information, it's important to be uh, eff effectively predisposed to action on issues where you can fix it afterwards. Now, obviously, in education, you can't always fix things afterwards, and it's important to run pilots, but there's a lot of times when you can course correct, and it's better to shoot first and course correct after. Uh, many people who have worked with us many, uh, for a long time know there's been cases where we do something, and then like a month later, we're like, oops, <laughs> here's the new plan, uh, and the new plan is obviously the better one, uh, but it's at least part of that is why we, we move so quickly. Uh, one of my favorite examples is when we decided to make a middle school course. Uh, we had gotten enough feedback that people wanted a middle school course. Uh, now, today at our scale, we'd probably run a survey. Back then, we just said, okay, let's make a middle school course, <laughs> um, uh, which is a big investment to make. Uh, and then that was the right decision, was making the course. The wrong decision was the name we chose for the course. Uh, and as soon as we said we're making a new middle school course, we chose this name out of homage to, to the Exploring CS course that we had previously been working with. Uh, and you know, we meant it to say that as a compliment, we're gonna draw so much inspiration from the things we learned and the message of equity from that course. Uh, and that, that sort of uh, compliment was actually received as an insult and we're like, oh my God, they got insulted that we're using a similar name. Uh, and so it took some time to basically crowdsource a different name which led to the new name for CS Discoveries. Uh, and this, this course that we built, uh, you know, just two and a half years later after, since that decision, it's become the largest course in middle school computer science. Already almost one third of all middle schools in America are teaching com computer science discoveries, which is unbelievable. And this summer, 5,000 middle school teachers are gonna attend workshops, which will more than double that base. Uh, and it's because we move fast uh, and course correct. The other thing about moving fast and course correcting, which is the hardest thing to do, especially if you're a nonprofit that doesn't have a revenue stream, is to execute first and raise funding after. Uh, and that may seem easy uh, for me to say because Code.org currently has funding, uh, but it's not always been that way. You know, the, the first people we hired, uh, well, the first person was myself and I didn't take a salary, and the second was Cameron Wilson who was loaned to us without us paying him. But then the next five or six people we hired we had maybe three months of cash <laughs> to, to pay them. Uh, I'm not sure why they didn't ask, uh, but basically we're like, we're gonna figure out how to raise enough money to pay you more than the first three months. Um, and so, but that didn't stop us from hiring. Uh, it just made us fundraise more aggressively. And when we decided to build the CS Discoveries course, that was a multi-million dollar investment. A normal nonprofit would say, we need multiple millions of dollars to fund the building of this course. We just said, we need to start hiring immediately and build this course and then, Meanwhile, also fundraise to, to support the, the hiring we just did. Um, that's hard to do, and if you're running a nonprofit, I urge you to talk to your board and try to see can you switch to that mental model uh, because it enables you to move so much faster. Um, then lastly, the, things, the last two items, I'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit in more depth about these are partnerships to scale, but measuring the results of those partnerships and then establishing sustainable funding so things stick around. Uh, all of our growth has been due to the partnerships we've built. Uh, and now we can't partner on everything, but on the things that we want to scale, we scale them using partnerships. The PD programs we've built started in 2013 by us flying our own staff individually to different places to host workshops. Uh, and then in 2014, we basically built a program of affiliates to, to teach our K-5 course while we continued flying around facilitators for middle school and high school until in 2015, we built a, a network of what we called professional learning partners. And then one year later, we learned these partners did more than professional learning, so we called them regional partners. And then one year later, we merged that program with our K-5 program, and now we're looking to expand our PD uh, globally with international partners. Uh, this network of partners has done incredible things for, for the computer science movement. It's now a network of uh, about five dozen partners all around the country that are basically the CS hubs for their region. And these aren't code.org hubs, they're CS hubs. They're obviously committed to the code.org curriculum for the pieces that we provide, but for things like robotics kits, which we don't provide, if you're a Sphero or a Wonder Workshop, these CS hubs can be a fantastic channel of getting those devices and associated curriculum in schools. Or if you're a Bootstrap or a Project Guts, these partners can all, with their network of facilitators near them and the connections they've built to the schools, can all do that as well. Uh, 
And so this infrastructure that we built is a big part of the sustainability, the CS movement. A large part of the success of partnerships also comes from measuring the results of partners. So every one of our partners, we give them data and we also see the data of what's happening in their school districts or in their regions, what's the usage of our courses in their region and so on. Uh, and this is part of why we built our own curriculum platform is so that we have the access to that data and we can reflect it back to the partners. And one of the key things we learned is we don't need to hold our partners accountable because they do it themselves. They see the data that we see and they see where things are falling short and they, that, that's enough for them to know, oh wow, I'm not doing as well as the other cohort of partners uh, and it enables the community to basically self-improve by seeing the data of how they work. Now getting back to the, the pieces of the puzzles uh, of, of what code.org does, every one of these pieces has grown with partnerships. Whether it's the 60 or so partners that do our outreach in PD, whether it's the 200 partners that make curriculum tutorials or that we link to their curriculum or participate in the Hour of Code or so on, whether it's the 200 or 300 partners globally that uh, help spread our work internationally, or the around 60 partners from ESIP to the College Board to Microsoft in our, in our advocacy coalition, everything we've done has scaled because the, the things we care the most about, we identify partnerships to make them grow. Uh, but these partnerships aren't enough. Uh, sustainability and funding is another big piece. Uh, and for any of you working on computer science, this is a pretty important message because we're at a point of transition for computer science. Uh, the transition for us is we, we all know that in the long run, NSF funding will dry up. And by that, I don't mean that it'll go away, but I mean programs that are doing the same thing and want to do it more and more and more won't be able to continue calling it research each time they do it. The NSF funds are for research and trying new things. If you're trying to scale, that's not something that the NSF is necessarily for. And I've had many NSF grantees ask me, like, how do we get access to something that's, so we don't need to invent new research each time. Uh, but meanwhile, tech philanthropy funding, it's not that it will dry up, but it can't scale to the size that we need for every school in America to get computer science. Meanwhile, 90% of education is funded locally by the state, by the school district, by local donors or the PTA. But most of that money isn't going to computer science right now. Uh, however, in just the last few years, and as you've heard throughout today, we've now unlocked tens of millions of dollars in state and federal funding per year. Most of that money has not yet flown to any of the folks in this room to actually move aside, move CS programs forward. And one of the things we need the entire community to do together is to basically tap into that funding. Uh, and it's not just the states that have allocated funding. Many states have made CS mandatory to be taught in schools or even mandatory to be learned by every student as part of their K-8 standards, which means schools now have funding for professional development uh, of, of teachers, which means all of us need to figure out what's the time frame in which we transition away from PD being free for schools, and especially how quickly can we move away from this idea of paying the teachers stipends to attend PD. Uh, and this isn't an unexpected transition. I remember when we started Code.org, uh, I remember telling uh, our team that the very, very first teachers that attend our PD, we practically need to bribe them to attend, and the very, very last teachers, they're gonna be begging to attend because they're gonna be the only schools that don't do this thing. Uh, and we're somewhere in the middle of that transition right now. Uh, we did a recent survey of the principals who sent teachers to Code.org PD programs last summer. 40% of them said they would have paid to attend the workshops that we basically funded to make free for those schools. Uh, now 40% is not 100%, uh, so I'm not sure exactly how we'll use this data, but we need to be mindful that this is a transition point and somewhere over the next few years, all of us that are doing computer science PD should figure out whether we can tap into state funds or federal funds or school funds or some other route. Uh, that money is there now and the momentum we've built for computer science means these schools will use those budgets. The other thing that can really help unlock this kind of funding is great research, uh, which has not historically been a strength of code.orgs, but something we, we hope to get more and more partnerships to help us with. Uh, one example is recently we uh, published something, or we didn't publish it, we uh, promoted something that was published, this question of does computer science help students learn math, and a research study by Outlier Research in Broward found that among resourceful teachers teaching code.org, extra use of code.org in classrooms directly correlated with better test scores with math, reading, and science. Now there's 
a number of things that are a big deal about this. First, how fantastic it was that Outlier, a partner of ours working with Broward County, a district partner of ours funded by the research, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation to do this research, came out with the study. We literally have no, no role in it other than receiving the result and, and hearing about it. Uh, the second is showing any kind of linkage of improvements in math or English or science are fantastic for basically growing the CS movement, both here and especially globally. Uh, and then the last part is the caveats uh, that are really important to mention, which is this finding was about correlation and not about causation. And it's critical that as the CS movement grows, we need to recognize that we're in the big leagues now. Uh, a lot of the sort of loosey-goosey research findings that we may have relied on in earlier years aren't going to hold up at the level of sort of scrutiny that CS is now at. We're now at the point where computer science is going to be competing with other fields for funding. Uh, and uh, in the past, computer science has been so small it can be ignored. It's not something that can be ignored as much anymore, but it also means the research that we do is going to need to hold up to a higher bar. Now, looking to the future, I want to ask folks for a few ways to help. Uh, one way, uh, and this is one of the top things that I hear about all the time from schools and we don't have any good answer for, is the idea of integrating computer science and even machine learning in other subjects like math or science or history. Uh, and when I say we don't have any answer, I mean code.org hasn't done anything to do this, but there's many other organizations that have done this, such as the, the bootstrap modules for machine learning and data science and algebra, or the Project Guts models, uh, modules for modeling and simulation and science. Uh, but our industry, our, our field needs more of this because schools want to teach computer science as part of math, starting as early as, as elementary school in math uh, and all the way through you know, data science subjects in history. Um, the other thing we need from the community is uh, much stronger research, as I alluded to before. There's not a single research paper in the computer science education that holds up to the what works clearinghouse evidence bar of without reservations. And the, the most expensive and the most generous grant programs from the federal government require this evidence bar that pretty much the CS education research community has not yet met. Uh, and this is something we can all get behind. Uh, the third is the recently announced K-12 CS access report, which code.org and the CSTA are partnering on. Uh, this is to collect granular data on a school-by-school -school basis to know where is CS taught. Uh, ever since we started code.org, I've been asked, how many schools teach computer science? And the answer has always been less than half, you know, or some you know, vague percentage point, because we don't actually know. Nobody actually knows. And the CS access report is going to get school by school data of which schools teach CS and which schools don't teach CS, and the ones that teach it, kind of how much do they teach it. This will both give us all a measure of how we're doing as a movement, and it'll also help us know which are the schools, if you want to go uh, outreach to schools and get them to change what they're doing, knowing which schools to go after is, is an easy thing, and it's helpful. Um, Global expansion via partnerships and advocacy is also a big part of what we're doing, and people who are interested in that should think about what can we do to make this movement more global. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, transitioning our PD programs to be funded by the government and by schools is something that we need the entire community's help with. Now, uh, before I close, I want to say something about keeping our eyes on the prize. Uh, and you know, as a movement, the computer science movement is really a family. Uh, and families have disagreements. I know I've personally been part of disagreements myself, uh, but families talk out their issues, uh, and that's something that brings them closer together, and, and they talk out their issues and find the things that, that they have in common. What we all have in common is the shared vision that every student in every school should have the opportunity to learn computer science. And I urge us all not to let the adults get in the way of what is best for the kids. And this gets me back to the, my own story that I started with. Uh, I wanted to say something about politics, uh, and by politics I don't mean CS community politics, I mean US politics. Uh, as an Iranian immigrant, uh, I would have personally been banned from entering the United States if today's administration was in charge when I left the country, uh, my, my home country. Uh, so it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out my political preference. Uh, I vocally and passionately supported President Obama, and in fact, I met with him many times to witness support for computer science, even starting before Code.org launched, and I've been a vocal critic of the current administration's policies. But I put all of that behind uh, in working with the current administration to get funding for computer science, 
and I put all my politics behind traveling the world and around the country to work with governments to get funding and support for computer science. By far the biggest personal challenge I faced in the, in the time I've led code.org uh, was the CS community's kind of toxic and hyper-partisan reaction to the White House support for computer science, uh, especially from leaders whose actual job is to advocate for computer science for students. And I wanted to urge everybody in the community to put their personal politics and their personal political agenda behind the idea of CS education. We're, we're part of and leading the most nonpartisan movement in the history of education in this country. Many, many great leaders in this movement are passionate and ardent Democrats, and many are passionate Republicans. And in a time of deep, deep division in our country and in our politics, we can either let our politics work against our shared mission, or we can find strength in our shared mission and show the rest of our country how easy it is to find common ground. I choose the shared mission that every student in every school should have the opportunity to learn computer science. Thank you very much. And do I have time for questions? Do you, I think, three questions. <laughs> Sorry, that was longer than I was So Amrita in the back has a microphone, and I have one too. And so if you have a question, raise your hand, and we will come in and get you, and uh, stand up and say your name and your organization and ask your question. Thank you, hi. My name is Selva and I'm with Code for Fun. And my question is, um, so great work on the, the US uh, and national, uh, but what's next for the worldwide? I mean, do you have any uh, advice or do you have any plan on like broadening the access to computer science? Even in Europe, Africa, I mean, all those countries, you could definitely use it. So there's at least 200 or so organizations around the globe that are doing things like this in their own countries. Uh, and many of those just started in the last five years or so. Uh, and many who have been doing it for longer. Uh, so my first view is that it's not code.org's job to go to other countries to, to run their education system or improve their education system. It's, what the most we can do is to help the existing people doing that to basically get funding, get support, and, uh, and you know, see how we can help them. And this is very similar to what we do in, in this country with our, our own regional partners. Uh, my personal passion is to do this work in Latin America and the Middle East. Uh, so those are where I'm going to be personally spending my own uh, time the most, uh, visiting whether it's with ministers of education or, or with the local NGOs that are doing this. Uh, but every, not, not every country, but lots and lots of countries are now already part of this movement and doing things. As I mentioned early on, there's 25 countries, many of which are actually ahead of the United States. When we look at, our, at the code.org platform, uh, Italy and Turkey have more usage per capita than the United States, which is stunning because in the US, the US, the use of code.org is already pretty significant. Two thirds of all fifth graders in the US have an account on code.org which is unbelievable for something that didn't exist five years ago. But there's more than that in Italy and in, and in Turkey. So I think it's already happening, and we just want to pour fuel on the fire. Amazing. Any other questions? Anything? Thank you. you Stand up about, your, name, your name and your org, please. Hi, I'm Ani Martinez. I'm with the Remake Learning Network in Pittsburgh. You talked about making a very strategic decision not to become a network. Do you think that it's possible, and please be very honest, that networks can be equitable? What do you mean by network? Well, you decided not to become a network, right? Not to make code.org a network, right? Because you said it privileges already privileged people, the already lucky ones. Oh, I'm sorry. We chose not to go into after school. Uh, what we chose is basically to go after the main school system rather than going into after school. Uh, it wasn't about being a network or not being a network. Oh, OK. Uh, sorry. <laughs> then I misunderstood you. That's good news. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think networks are great, depending on good. what you mean. Thank you. About after school in California, it's only those schools that are low performing and high student of color um, population and high English learners that get the funding for after school. So I would urge you to, to consider code.org for California after school programs uh, certainly are not privileged. Also, I'm very curious um, about the survey. 
that you're doing for K-12 schools. How about us nonprofits that are also doing coding and robotics? Is there uh, ideas of, of surveying uh, how the nonprofits are maybe addressing the need as well? Um, so with respect to the first thing you said, uh, we're obviously supportive of both in school and after school. The, the course correction we made was instead of saying we'd only do this in after school, was to say the school system should change. Uh, and in fact, code.org's curriculum is used broadly in lots and lots of after school clubs. Uh, and our personal focus has been on the school day. Uh, and there's been just this cottage industry growing of after school programs embracing computer science in addition. Uh, so in terms of the, the survey that we're doing, we're ultimately measuring which schools teach computer science. And in many after school programs are in those schools. And in fact, uh, they can go into that report and say that this school teaches it, but as an after school activity or, you know, rather than a school day activity or as a side, you know, elective rather than the for every student or so on. I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hadi. Another right. round of applause. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah.